Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 10, Cagliostro and the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry from Masonic Orders of Fraternity by Manly P. Hall. Cagliostro and the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry a controversy has raged for more than a century and a half over the man who proudly proclaimed himself to be the Count di Cagliostro, Grand Copt of the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry. The facts have never been of interest to his detractors, and the popular accounts are of slight value to anyone. The flamboyant Count was a hero of the French people at a time when the affliction of the populace was certain to bring down upon its object the animosity of the state and church. If Cagliostro's memory suffered from the reports circulated by the Inquisition, it fared no better when entrusting to the gentle keeping of such literary figures as Thomas Carlyle and Alexander Dumas Pierre. A life of Cagliostro was issued under the aspects of the Apostolic Chamber. The August Body, happily inspired by rumors circulated by Bali Courier d'El Europe, decided that the benefactor of the people, whose portrait influential ladies carried on their fans, was in truth a Sicilian adventurer, one Giuseppe Bassamo, wanted by the police of Sicily for several crimes, including participation in an assassination plot, a fickle world with a relish for gossip and reluctant to suspect good where ill was possible, took the Balsamo legend to its breast and has cuddled it there ever since. The present century has found a new excuse for assuming Cagliostro was an imposter. The reasoning is simple and empiric, the Count claimed to possess supernatural or at least superphysical powers and faculties. This in itself justifies his condemnation without further investigation. True Bridge, one of the few to take the unpopular side of the controversy, was inspired to a dramatic summary of the case. After having been ridiculed with abuse till he was unrecognizable, prejudice, the foster child of calumny, proceeded to lynch him, so to speak. For over 100 years, his character was dangled on the gibbet of infamy, upon which the sobriety of tradition has inscribed a curse upon anyone who shall attempt to cut him down. His fate has been his fame. He is remembered in history, not so much for anything he did, as for what was done to him. As Truebridge astutely pointed out, Nobody who had ever met Balsamo ever knew, recognized, or even saw him as Cagliostro. Balsamo was wanted by the police of both London and Paris, but the gendarmerie and all the secret agents employed to discover unsavory characters were remarkably slow to suspect that the genial, well-publicized, and, according to his enemies, Notorious Alessandro Cagliostro was really the despicable Balsamo. With all his enemies at work, night and day to accomplish his undoing, it seems strange that the simplest means of discrediting the Count were not presented more effectively. In any event, no one ever emerged from Cagliostro's past to compromise him. It would be difficult to reconcile the mental levels of the two men. When last officially exclaimed, Balsamo was a typical rascal, uncultured and uncouth. There was little to suggest that he would acquire distinction as a man of letters or as a proficient in obscure arts and sciences. Even had he resolved thus to enlarge his faculties, this Balsamo would have required a long period of conditioning. He could scarcely have attained a superlative education without someone, somewhere, remembering the circumstances and reporting them to the anxious authorities. Had Cagliostro really been Balsamo, and had he remained obscure, he might have escaped recognition, but not after the Count's picture had become a household furnishing and reasonable facsimiles of his face, cast in bronze and plaster or carved in marble, has been everywhere exhibited. 
Cagliostro was condemned by the Inquisition Court as having incurred the censors and penalties pronounced against heretics, dogmatics, heresiarchs, and propagators of magic and superstition. He was found guilty and condemned to the censures and penalties against all persons who, in any manner whatever, favored or formed societies and conventicles of Freemasonry, as well as by the edicts of the Council of State against all persons convicted of this crime in Rome or in any other place of the dominions of the Pope. The Inquisitional Office would scarcely have pronounced a sentence that was certain to cause grave criticism in Protestant countries, and with the powerful Masonic orders, had less controversial grounds been available. If Cagliostro was Giuseppe Balsamo, why was he not tried for the crimes of this man and openly persecuted on legitimate charges? To convict a man to perpetuate imprisonment for founding a Masonic Lodge within the boundaries of the Papal State could scarcely have been a popular procedure on the eve of the French Revolution. Had the Count actually been an evil character, with a reputation for crime and imposture, these more pertinent and devastating offenses would have ruined his standing before the world and his esoteric leanings would have been slight bearing upon the administration of justice. Even D. Mirandi, a spy, blackmailer, unprincipled journalist, and editor of the Lee Carrier D.L. Europe, admitted that Cagliostro was initiated into Freemasonry in London, April 12, 1717. On this occasion, the Count identified himself as a colonel of the 3rd Regiment of Brandenburg. Truce Bridge said that Cagliostro's Masonic certificate was for some time in a famous collection of autographs belonging to the Marquis of Sarkusiwan. The Esperance Lodge was Cagliostro's mother lodge, was affiliated with the Order of Strict Observance, Truesbridge also found evidence that the Count was admitted as a Freemason into a lodge of the Order of Strict Observance at The Hague, and it was intimated that he received Masonic degrees in Germany. De Morandi attempted to belittle Cagliostro's Masonic standing by intimating that the members of the Lodge de Esperance were, for the most part, insignificant persons from the humbler trades and crafts of Soho. The Count promptly replied that he was proud to be acknowledged a brother of good and honorable men, and it had not occurred to him to check their financial or social standing. At least, it is estimated with certainty that the Count was a Freemason and had been duly and properly initiated into the Order. The founding of the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry was shrouded in mystery. Several lines of research have suggested themselves to Masonic historians. One group is convinced that Cagliostro's right was derived from a Kabbalistic masonry introduced in 1754 by the mystical philosopher Martins de Pasquale. Perhaps Pasquale was a Portuguese Jew. In any event, his Masonic researches were strongly influenced by the esoteric tradition of that race and the initiates of his rite were called Kohens, which is the Hebrew word for priest. In Paris, in 1768, he attracted an influential circle of scholarly persons. Later, he inherited properties in the West Indies and died in port au prince The Inquisition claimed that, while in London, Cagliostro acquired a manuscript by one, George Coston, which he amplified and enriched by his own researches. If so, this Coston was a product of Pasquale's thinking, for this Kabbalist had many followers and admirers in England. In fairness to Cagliostro, attention should be given to his own account of his origin and destiny. The story, though generally dismissed as fiction, never has been disproven. The Count claimed to have been instructed in his esoteric arts by Arabian masters. His parents were Christians of noble family who had died when their illustrious son was but three months of age, leaving him under the protection of the great Mufti. 
Cagliostro was never told the name of his father, but was attended by a most learned tutor named Aldatas, who was a master of secret and mysterious arts. Aldatas took the boy to Mecca in his twelfth year and presented him to the Grand Sharif. At that time, Cagliostro had no name other than Achariat by which he was known in Medina. He remained three years in Mecca, then went to Egypt where he explored the pyramids. After three more years in Africa and Asia, he arrived at the island of Rhodes where he was entertained by Emmanuel Pinto, Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. Pinto, a man of despotic methods, became Grand Master in 1741 and gained distinction for resisting papal encroachments on his authority. Cagliostro assisted him in alchemical and medical researches. All the toss died at Malta, and it was on this island that Archarat first assumed European dress and took the name of Count de Cagliostro. According to Alephus Levi, the name All the Toss encloses the word Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom, and the prefix all, implying god or divine, suggests that the true teacher of the bizarre count was the divine mind. All the toss could also be the name given to an initiate of the mysteries at the time of his elevation. It has been suggested that Alatos was really the elusive Dr. Kumar, who gave instructions and in magic to Adam Weishaupt the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati. Alexander Wilder has noted that the word Cagliostro is made up of Kalos, meaning beautiful, and Aster, a star or sun. The tie between Cagliostro and the Illuminati was as interesting as his possible association with the Knights Templar. The Inquisitional reports show that Cagliostro confessed during his trial that he had been initiated into the Illuminati in an underground cave near Frankfurt on the Main. Some writers have hazarded the speculation that the Illuminati or the Templars supplied Cagliostro with at least part of the funds with which he was usually so well provided. The Illuminist rituals, as expanded by Weishaupt and Von Nigge, certainly had strong Egyptian coloring but there is evidence that Cagliostro was well advanced in his own project before his direct contact with the Bavarian group. Some historians suggest that Egyptian masonry was introduced into Europe about 1771 by a merchant of Jutland who had been in Egypt and had also visited Malta where he could have contacted Cagliostro. The doctrines of the Jutland merchant. In the course of introducing his own right, the Count also revealed a remarkable knowledge of the obscure doctrines of Emanuel Swedenborg. Kaljostro claimed, while using the name Count Sutkowski, that he was the messenger of a Swedenborgian secret society existing in Avignon. While Cagliostro proved before a group of French intellectuals, including the distinguished Court D. Gibelin, that he was an accomplished Egyptologist, the Egyptian rite does not include any profound exposition of the religion or philosophy of ancient Egypt. It is surprising, indeed, that so little is known about Cagliostro's esoteric teachings. His lectures to the more advanced members of his rites were probably not included in the surviving manuscripts. The Egyptian rite of Freemasonry is the only ritual of that period, however, which actually included transcendental experiments and formulas. In our collection is a contemporary manuscript of the Mother Lodge of Adoption of High Egyptian Masonry. Founded by the Copt, it is addressed to the very dear brother, Robellan, member of the Royal Lodge of St. John of Scotland, from the Friend of Nature and Humanity, the Rituals of Egyptian Masonry and its Lodge of Adoption, female masonry, were almost identical. The arrangements of the Lodge furniture, the symbols, ceremonies, officers, and the lectures given new initiates were but slightly altered from the female degrees. 
The unique feature of Cagliostro's system contained in the closing pages of the manuscript, while referred to by several writers, has not been examined in detail. According to the manuscript, the Eternal God knows that man cannot accomplish his proper dominion over himself and nature without the knowledge of moral and physical perfection without penetrating into the true sanctuary of nature and without possessing the secret doctrine of the order. This doctrine bestows physical immortality and the perfection of the moral nature. By the extension of the corporeal existence, the initiate attains wisdom, intelligence, the faculty of understanding and of speaking all languages and the precise happiness of becoming an intermediary between God and mankind. Cagliostro's Symbolic Seal Having so wonderfully attained, the initiate is now as one with heaven and earth. He can control the invisible spirits of the universe and can fulfill the works of the mysteries as revealed through the teachings of the Grand Copte. Then follows the description of an alchemical regeneration of the human body, made possible in 40 days through the use of a small quantity of a secret medicine or substance supplied by the Grand Comte. The use of this medicine, in conjunction with a carefully specified routine of eating and sleeping, results in a complete purification and renewal of the body, even to the hair, teeth, and fingernails. On the 40th day, the renewed person is ready to go forth into the world to teach the truth, to overcome evil, and to bear witness to the glory of the eternal God. This mysterious renewal of life can be repeated every five years, so that the initiate can remain in the mortal world until it pleases God to call this sanctified person to his eternal reward. The actual rituals of the Egyptian rite were not known by any means so fanatical as the accounts published by by Guillaume Figuier and the Marcus de Luce. It is possible that some of the glamour of the French court penetrated into the sanctuaries of the Egyptian Rite, but if so, such spectacles were limited to a few lodges composed mostly of countries and their ladies. Actually, the Egyptian Rite, with certain exceptions, mostly symbolical or philosophical, was no more bizarre than the so-called regular lodges. The actual record of Cagliostro's activity, if judged impartially, revealed that, in spite of the absurd reports circulating concerning him, the Count was a humanitarian of parts, a champion of the exploited masses, a practical idealist, and a teacher of a highly ethical, constructive, and moral philosophy. The rest is hearsay. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.